Thank him for all that he does in your life. Shout the victory in his name. Amen. Glory to his name. A story is told about an armed robber named Dennis Curtis, who was arrested in 1992 in Rapid City, South Dakota. Curtis apparently has uh, some scrupulous uh, rules about himself as far as th thievery. In his wallet, the uh, police found a sheet of paper on which was written the following code. I will not kill anyone unless I have to. Number two, I will take cash and food stamps, no checks. I will rob only at night. I will not wear a mask to disguise my face. I will not rob many marts or 7-Eleven stores. If I get chased by cops on foot, I will get away. If chased by vehicle, I will not put the lives of innocent civilians on the line. I will rob only seven months out of the year, and in the remaining five months, I will take time off. I will enjoy robbing from the rich to give to the poor. This thief had a sense of morality, but it was flawed because it was based on his own misguided sinful standards. However, after being caught when he stood before the court, he was not judged by the standards he had set for himself, but the higher standards given that he stood guilty of. Amen. Likewise, you and I one day will stand before God and we all will be judged. None of us will be exempt. We will not be judged by the code of hu human morality. We will, or we've written ourselves, nor the laws or, lo or local or national government, but we'll be judged by God's perfect law found in the Bible. Amen. As we turn our attention now to Genesis chapter 7, as we connect what's going on today with what was going on then, and how much you'll see that a whole lot has not changed. Amen. People are still disobedient to God, no matter what God says, no matter what God does. And so a bit of background on Genesis 7 is that in Genesis chapter 3, we learned about the fall of man, which caused the dysfunction of humanity by Adam and Eve eating from the tree uh, that God warned them not to. Also, all of us were born sinners in desperate need of a Savior because of their fall. In chapter 4, we saw how quickly the sin of the parents were passed on to the children, when Cain rose up and killed his brother Abel, as a result, Cain was banished from the presence of God the rest of his life. In chapter 5, we were told that Adam had another son named Seth. However, this son was born in Adam's image, meaning Adam's sinful nature. And last week in chapter 6, we saw how quickly sin spread to an entire uh, human race. And it says this. In chapter 6, in verse 5, it said, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth, and that every intent of thoughts of their hearts was evil continually. So the Lord was sorry that he had made mankind on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. Then the Lord said, I will wipe out mankind whom I have created from the face of the land, mankind and animals as well and crawling things and the birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I made them. The verse 8 said, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now today as we focus on Genesis chapter 7, we see God's wrath on all humanity because of our sinfulness. Amen. Today's message is entitled God's Judgment on a Dysfunctional Society. We've been talking about the dysfunction that began after the fall. We talked about how Adam and Eve became very dysfunctional when they disobeyed God and they passed that dysfunction on to their children. And as society grew, society passed it on and on and on and on. And we even gave a definition of dysfunction because we said dysfunction can be defined as the refusal or neglect to function or operate for the very purpose God created me and you. In other words, if you and I are not ful fulfilling our God-given responsibilities by biblical definition, we're dysfunctional. Amen? Amen? You ought to be tired of being dysfunctional. Amen? Amen? Wouldn't you rather func function for the very purpose that God put you on this earth? Amen? Wouldn't you rather function in the way that God blesses you as you carry out his plan and purpose on this earth? Wouldn't you rather function in a way that you don't like any good thing from the Lord because he has promised to apply all of my needs and your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus? Amen? This is such a deep chapter. 
And there's so much going on in this chapter. I'm going to read the chapter. I'm going to explain the chapter. And I'm going to give you the points at the end. Amen. Amen. Chapter 7, verse 1 said, And the Lord said to Noah, Into the ark. He said, He invites Noah into the ark. You and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this generation. So he tells him, come into the ark. The idea is that God was in the ark and he would be with Noah in the ark. So he called Noah to come into the ark with him. Did you all catch that? See, you thought he just sent him into the ark. No, he invited him to come into the ark because his presence was already in the ark. He said, go into the ark, but come. Plainly implying that God was himself in the ark, waiting to receive Noah and his family into the big ship that was to be their place of refuge where all the other people on the face of the earth were drowned. We know in the previous chapter, God told Noah to build this big old boat. He told him what type of wood to use. And we know from scripture that Noah took 120 years to build this boat. And we talked about this last week that no, it did not take Noah that long to build a boat. It took, he did, built the boat in God's timing. Because what Noah did, Noah was preaching to the people and he was building the boat. So he would preach some and he worked some. And he'd preach some more and then he worked some more. And he'd preach some more and he worked some more. So he's preaching and building for 120 years. And you might ask yourself, why did it take 120 years? Because that was designated time that God gave. Those 120 years. Because God gave the time that he was given them to repent. What if God says to me and you that I'm going to give you 120 days to repent? And after that 120 days, I'm going to take action against you for every person on this earth that refuses to repent. But what if God shortened that? And God said, I'm only going to give you 120 minutes. So you got two hours to figure this out or you done. Amen. Would that cause you to change your behavior? Would that cause you to change the way you live? If you knew that you only had two hours, what would you do different if you knew that you had four months? Would you go home and get your house in order? Would you go home and do things different? Or you just carry on just like God hadn't said anything? Whether all of humanity except Noah and his family, Noah's wife, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's three sons and their wives, eight people total out of all the people on the face of this earth at that time. Those were the only eight people invited into the ark. Because they're the only one accept the invitation. Because the invitation had to be that you had to be a person of righteousness. That's your, that was your invitation. Do you realize that there's an invitation to heaven and that invitation is only because we have righteousness through Jesus Christ our Lord? Amen. Everybody talking about heaven ain't going. Because you got to have a passport. It's not a physical passport, it's a spiritual passport. Amen. And it's got to be signed by Jesus. If your passport is signed by Muhammad, you're in trouble. If your passport is signed by Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, you're in trouble. If your passport is signed by Charles Taz Russell, the founder of Jehovah's Witness, you're in trouble. Because if it's not signed by Jesus, you don't have a passport and you're not going to heaven. Could you imagine Noah's building this boat? He's got all of this wood and this is a three-decker boat, by the way. And he's out there building and could you imagine being Noah's neighbors? Brother Noah, what are you doing? I'm building a boat. Where are you going with it? <laughs> He's building a, moat, a boat in the middle of dry land. Oh, it's going to rain. Oh, no, it's rain. God's going to send a flood. What's a flood? Could you imagine having this conversation with people? Noah had to look like the nutty professor. To everybody else but God and his family. And you can only imagine that as they're building, I would 
Believe that Noah's sons helped him build his boat. Could you imagine only eight righteous people? And God had warned them for 120 years that a flood is coming. Judgment is coming. And because they had a whole 120 years to think about it. But could you imagine being caught on that 120th day? They didn't know, because more than likely they weren't keeping time, but God was. So when that day came, when the floodgates opened and the heavens opened, did you not know that not only did the heavens open, the ground opened? Y'all don't read the text too close, do you? Here's the thing about this text that we need to pay attention to. We know that God said he would not send another flood. He would not destroy the world like this again. We know God put the rainbow in the sky as, as a reminder that he wouldn't do that. But he didn't say he wouldn't destroy it again. He just said he won't do it that way. Because there will be another judgment. Amen. Make sure you're not caught up in that judgment. And that you make sure that you are right with Jesus Christ today. So again, the Lord said to Noah, enter into the ark, come into the ark, you and your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this generation. He, his family, the only one got the invitation. The only one got the invitation. Verse 2, he said, you shall take with you seven pairs of every clean animal, a male and his female, and two of the animals that are not clean, and a male and his female. Nor was to bring into the ark two of every living creature so that their kinds will be spared. God made a distinction between the clean and the unclean animals. Of the clean animals, Noah was to take with him seven pairs rather than just one. These were for Noah and his family to eat after exiting the ark as well as to provide sacrifice to God in worship. As you will see, one of the first things that Noah did was he built the altar and he worshiped God. When he came off that boat. Also the birds of the sky, seven pairs, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of the earth. Now, this chapter is borrowing language from Genesis 1. Because it kept using the language reproduced after their kind. God would create an animal and put him on the earth, and he would tell that animal, reproduce after your kind. He put a horse and tell the horse, to reproduce after your kind. Chickens, dogs, elephants, you name it, reproduce after their kind. The reason why that's significant, because if you understand that, you, you understand that the theory of evolution is wrong. And the reason why is because the way God created uh, everything he created was it reproduces after its kind. What that means is, is that a bird cannot become a horse because it cannot reproduce after their kind. And a horse cannot become a cat because it cannot reproduce after that kind. And a cat cannot be a, it can become an ape because it cannot reproduce after that kind. And an ape cannot become a man because it cannot reproduce after that kind. Amen? Just understanding language in Scripture, you'd understand that the God we know and love and worship does understand science. It just don't work the way humanity tries to make it work. Amen? And so, because God knew that once the flood had ended and God had destroyed everything else, then everything else had to continue to go. Now, God could have wiped out all the humanity, all the animal kingdom, and started over, but he didn't do it that way. He spared Noah and seven other people with Noah. Verse 4 says, For after seven more days I will send rain on the earth, for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will wipe out the, from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. God killed everything on land. You might say, what happened to the fish? It says everything on land. Read the text. That means the, the fish and everything in the, the, the oceans, they survived. Because it was the land that was polluted because of what man had done. And so God killed Everything. He drowned everything. But watch this. It says that 
So Noah acted in accordance with everything that the Lord had commanded him. Can, can God say about that by me and you? Ever since you come to know Jesus Christ as saving Lord, can you say what God says about Noah? Can we say that we have acted in accordance with everything that the Lord has commanded us? If the answer is no, then you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Amen? Because you might have allowed your life to get in the way. You might have allowed other people to get in the way. You might have allowed family to get in the way. You might have allowed your profession to get in the way. You might have allowed your career to get in the way. So many people have time for other things, but not God. They don't have time for worship. And if they do have time for worship, it's every once in a while. As I said before, if you treat yourself physically like you treat yourself spiritually, you run out a long time ago. Amen? Because you eat on a regular basis, do you not? To fuel your body so that you can have the strength to go on. If you fed yourself physically, once again, like you feed yourself spiritually, a lot of us be dead a long time ago. Which is why a lot of us are dead spiritually a long time ago. Because we don't eat spiritually enough at God's table. Amen? We again see that Noah's Christian's heart. His Christian heart is on, on display. He obeyed God completely. Total obedience in the midst of evil times should be the supreme goal and desire of God's people. We live in evil days now. But there should be a difference between us and the rest of the world. When we're around other people, other people should know that you stand for Jesus. Because you don't talk like them, you don't walk like them, you don't act like them. Amen? There's something different about you. You're peculiar to them. And everything about us should be that we, be, we are trying to please God every day. Walk with him, understand his word, and follow in Jesus' footsteps. Verse 6 says, now Noah was 600 years old when the flood water came upon the earth. I'd imagine 600 years old, he's probably pretty tired. <laughs> but because he walked with God, he could sing that song, I've been running for Jesus a long, long time, but I'm not tired yet. Amen? That's because his strength was not in his physically, even though God blessed him that way, but his strength was spiritually. Amen? It said that Noah, his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him entered the ark because the waters of the flood. Of clean animals and, and and animals that are not clean and birds and everything that crawls on the ground. That means snails, snakes, skunks, buzzards. <laughs> everything. Could you imagine? Could you imagine being in this boat? Shut up in a boat that long? By the way, they were on that boat a little over a year. You got to do the math. It, it, you'd understand after you do all the math, you figure out by the time they left the ark, because they had to wait till all the water subsided. And it wasn't until after a year that the water subsided, they actually left the boat. They probably ran out the boat saying, fresh air, fresh air, fresh air. They probably were excited to be off that boat. Amen. I would imagine even the animals walking off the boat say, man, I'm. I'm <laughs> no offense, my brother, goat, but <laughs> I see you out there. <laughs> they all went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. Could you imagine having this daunting task? You had to go round up all these animals. That, is, that alone would have been a daunting task if it wasn't for the anointing of God that he had put on Noah. All Noah told them to do is come this way. Could you imagine? 
Noah's pointing out the animals that he wants to take on the ark. He points at that one and says, you, 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 but not you. <laughs> and he just commands them to come, and they come out two by two. And it takes them about seven days to load the ark with everything. And you thought it was, took you a while to load your stuff to go on vacation. Seven days. Because it says after seven days, that's how you know it took them seven days, that the waters of the flood came upon the earth. After all the preparations and after 120 years of God waiting for people to repent, the flood finally began. Only Noah, his wife, his sons, and their wives were spared with all the things on the land. The other things on land died. The number eight means new beginnings in Scripture. What God was doing with eight people was a new beginning. Amen? So it says in verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month of the seventh day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst. All right? What's the fountain of the great deep? That lets you know that water came from the earth. And the floodgates of the sky were open. So you had all of this water. And it said the rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. This was not a drizzle. This was the floodgates opening up. It had never rained on the earth up until that time. And it never rained like this and has not rained like this since. Amen. Verse 13 says, on this very same day, Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, the sons of Noah, and the Noah's, wife, uh, Noah's wife and the three wives of his son went with, with them into the ark. And they and every animal according to its kind and, and all the livestock according to their kind and every crawling thing that crawls on the earth according to its kind and every bird according to its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh which, was, which there was breath of life. Verse 16, those that entered, male and female of all the flesh, entered as God had commanded him, and the Lord closed the door behind him. Hmm. So you thought Noah shut the door. You thought Noah was the only reason why there was no water leaked in that boat. Because God shut them in and sealed them in. Amen. Yahweh's role in saving Noah, his family, and the animals come into few of view here. The narrator reminds the audience that the salvation of these few people is an act of divine grace. And the Lord shut him in. Noah did not have to shut the door any, on, on anyone's salvation. Could you be imagined? Could you be imagined other people that are around when it starts raining? How many people probably would have ran toward this boat? See, Noah had nothing to do with humanity being left out because Noah didn't shut the door. If it was up to Noah, he probably let his neighbor in. He probably said, come on in. I know you ain't no good, but, you know, you've been a halfway decent neighbor. Noah probably would have left somebody else in. But he said, God shut the door. God shut the door on humanity because God said, those are the only eight I'm going to save. And you could imagine as the floodgates opened and all of this fell on humanity, they had to know that God's word was real. But here's the key. It was too late. Because nothing you were going to do was going to get you in that boat. Nothing you were going to do was going to save you. Amen. You might have been a good swimmer. You might have been able to tread water for days. But I doubt if you can tread water for a whole year. Amen. God kept the door open until the last possible minute. But there came a time when the door had to be shut. When the door is open, it is open, just like it is now. But when it is shut, it will be shut. Jesus is the one who opens the door 
and he's the one who shuts the door. The ark was salvation for Noah, but condemnation for the world. There were no second chances for those left out. Yea, when 120 years were over and God's spirit would no longer strive with the men, there stood the great ark with its vast door wide open and still Noah continued to preach and to declare that all would be passed, would pass within that open portal into the ark of safety should be preserved from the coming destruction. Outside that door, death would reign universally, but Noah and those with him found peace. Verse 17 says, then the flood came upon the earth. Forty days and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. And the water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. This lets you know this was not a local flood. It was a universal flood. This was a worldwide flood. All the high mountains which were under the entire heaven. The description in verses 22-23 uh, supports the narrative this is a global flood. Verse 20 says the water prevailed 15 cubits. 15 cubits is 20 feet. Higher and the mountains were covered. The highest mountains were covered. 20 feet above that it was covered. So all the creatures that moved on the earth perished. Birds, livestock, animals, and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all of mankind. Of all that was on the dry land and all those whose nostrils was the breath of, uh, of the spirit of life died. So God wiped out every living thing that was upon the face of the land from mankind to animals to crawling things and the birds of the sky. And they were wiped out from the earth and only Noah was left together with those that were with him in the ark. Who are you hanging out with? Will you survive God's next judgment? For those in your household can say that we'll be together with the Lord in glory. Can you say that? Do you know that? Do you know if you're going to be there? So the water prevailed upon the earth for 150 days. Five months. But it took another seven months for it all to subside. So here's the question I have for you. What are six lessons we should learn from God sending the flood? Number one, God must punish sin. Number two, God gives warnings, but his patience eventually runs out. Number three, God has always saved people the same way by grace through faith. Or the Old Testament or New Testament. Number one again, God must punish sin. Some people say, I don't believe a loving God will send me to hell. There are people who believe that, there are people who say that. But what you got to understand that that same loving God that you say is loving, part of love is, is also discipline. Because when you love someone, you're disciplined. Amen. And I know it sounds strange when you tell your child it's going to hurt me more than hurt you. And your child looks at you like you lost your mind. Because what they don't understand, the last thing I want to do is be spanking you. And when I have to spank you, that hurts my heart because of the fact that I have to do it. And I'd rather not do it, but I have to do it because if I don't, then I'm not being a good parent. Amen? And God has to spank me and you because if he doesn't, he's not a good parent when you and I step out of line. Amen? So he must punish sin. He would not be a loving God. He would not be eternal. He would not be God if he didn't punish sin. Therefore, by his nature, he has to act on sin. And the time that you and I live on this earth, that is the time that God gives us to get this right. Now, most people don't live 120 years anymore like they did back then. Average person don't live that long. Nowhere near. So that means you and I got less than 120 years to get this right. From the time we're born and the time we die. 
That's how long God gives. That's the grace period that we can get this right with God. And we can decide that I want to walk with him, I want to live for him in eternity, or I can decide I got this, God, I'm going to do it my way. But again, God must punish sin. Number two, again, God gives warnings, but his patience eventually runs out. He's warning you today. Those of you tuning in, this is your warning. Those of you here in person, that's is your warning. For you to walk away and act like everything is fine, that means you didn't heed the warning. Because God doesn't have to allow you to live to get through this service. And he doesn't have to, have to allow you to live to get to the night or tomorrow morning. But if you're outside God's will by that time, then you're going to be judged by God for everything you've ever done. You can no longer play church. You can no longer lean on your religion because none of that's going to help you anyway. Third point again, God has always saved people the same way by grace through faith. He's always saved people by grace through faith. Number four, genuine faith leads to genuine obedience. If you are really, really, really connected with Jesus, then there's evidence. There's real, visible evidence that you belong to Jesus. Amen? That's out of your obedience. It doesn't mean that you're perfect, but it does mean you're striving. Amen? And you're striving every day to be more Christ-like. Less like ourselves and more like Christ. Number five, true witness demands separation from sin. As Noah is building this boat, and even before he started building this boat, his neighbors would have knew there was something different about him. So as he's building this boat and he's preaching, and could you imagine? You have people in your lives that you love dearly, but they're not saved. You know they're not saved. What if you were in Noah's shoes at that time? And you're telling your family members and you're telling your friends and co-workers and neighbors, come on, get in the boat with me. Well, what's the passport? What does it cost? Jesus already paid it all. All you got to do is accept him, a passport from him and come on in. And they turn you down. Could you imagine being Noah? Have to watch his neighbors drown? Could you imagine being Noah's kids? The other young couples that they may have hung out with or been around? Could you imagine as they watched their bodies float by and there was nothing they could do because they had done everything they should have done because they warned them while they still have breath in their body? Who are you warning? Do you even mourn yourself? Do you ever tell yourself, self, you better straight on fly white because God's going to get you? Sometimes you got to warn yourself. Sometimes you got to be mindful of your own actions, knowing that, again, sin has consequences. Amen? And the ultimate consequence for us is eternity in hell. The sixth and final point is this God condemns and and he condemns rebellion, but he rewards faithfulness to himself. He condemns rebellion. What's rebellion when you don't do what God told you to do? Anytime God tells you something, God tells you to come to church. I ain't doing that. That's rebellion. Read my Bible. You don't do that. God, that's rebellion. Have an active prayer life conversation with God daily. You don't do that. That's rebellion. To do and become what God put you on this earth to do. If you're not doing that, that's rebellion. And you might say, well, I help people, God, so that must not be rebellion. Well, you might be helping people, but not the way God wanted you to. You might have chosen a profession that, hey, this feels good to you, but it might not be what God chose you for. And God may have put you there, but you don't do what God put you there for. That's rebellion. Anytime that we do not do what God has wanted us to do. This is why some people don't come to church because they don't want to be reminded. That's why they won't open the Bible because they don't want to be reminded. Every invitation you get to get things right with God and you turn down an invitation, 
That's rebellion because God's going to hold you accountable for what you would have learned if you'd have showed up. Amen? John, the same John that was walked with Jesus. The same John that was one of Jesus' original disciples who also became an apostle. The same John who wrote, along with Paul, predominantly most of the New Testament. God was, they were the human instrument between John and the apostle Paul wrote much of the New Testament. That same John wrote the gospel of John. That same John wrote the epistle of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And that same John was the longest living apostle because he died on the island of Patmos. And on the island of Patmos, God gave him a revelation to write down. And that revelation became the book of Revelation. Because without the book of Revelation, you wouldn't know how the story ended. Have you ever been watching a movie and it's getting good and all of a sudden your TV go out? You ever been there before? <laughs> You're watching a movie and it's getting real good, and guess what? Here come the kids. You got emergency. Well, they got one, and you got to go fix it. And it's really not emergency. It's just they tore the doll head off, and now you got to glue, glue it back on. But that's their emergency. You got to go fix. You've been there before. You had a very good moment, everything going on. You want to see the end. See, that's how me and all, when, when, when it's climactic and, and it's the fourth quarter and my team is coming back and there's only 30 seconds left and my team got the ball and it's the 10-yard line and all of a sudden, my kid walked by the plug and knocked the plug out. And when I, I turned it back on, and then they say, boy, did you see that play? No, I didn't. Now you know how it feels, right? You get to that very moment. You want to see the end. If revelation is not added to the scriptures, guess what? We don't know how this ends. Oh, but thank God. God completed the story. If you were tracking the story, from Genesis all the way to Revelations, if you're tracking the story, man fell and became a sinner, and God implemented his redemptive plan. Amen? Amen? Giving us a right to the tree of life. And if we were left out and didn't get the book of Revelation, we'd be lost. We wouldn't know what's going on. But God wanted us to know what the conclusion was like. See, when God wrote what we just read in Genesis, guess what? God was going to write something similar because God knew there would be more people by the time that this is written in the end that more people I'm going to have to judge because more people will not get in the ark. In our case, it's not a physical ark. In our case, it's a spiritual ark. Amen. We get on boat with Jesus. Amen. Here's what it says in Revelations chapter 20, verse 11. This explains what he began to explain in the beginning. But see, that, at that time, when, when, he, when God hit a reset on humanity, humanity had a chance to get it right. But we still didn't get it right. Because now, see all those people who died that we read about in Genesis? They hadn't been judged yet. You got to understand this. If you die right now, you either go to smoking or non-smoking. You go to hell to heaven. But you still haven't been judged yet. You still got to be judged. Amen. The good news for us, our judgment is talked about in 2 Corinthians 5.10. Though we appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that our rewards will be, ter- be determined. The great right throne room judgment we're dealing with right here, deal- it deals with all the unsaved. Regardless of nationality. Regardless of gender, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of geography, and regardless of time. He said, then I saw a great white throne. And him who sat. This is, this is John talking about the revelation that God gave him to write down. Did you know that God, John was told he couldn't write everything down? But he was told specifically what to write. That we get 
to read about. Again, I saw the great, great right throne room judgment, and him who sat upon it, him is Jesus Christ, capitalized, for whom presence, earth, uh, present earth and heaven fled, and there was no place found for them. He said, I saw the dead and the, the great and the small. The dead or the unsaved? The great and the small, it, 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 the whole gamut of humanity. From the rich to the poor, to the black, to the white, to the Asian, Hispanic, and all others. For those who had great accomplishments on this earth and those who had none. The great and the small. And everything else in between. And then he says, standing before the throne. You and I will stand before the throne of God like a big courtroom scene one day. Amen. And he said, the books were open and another book was open, which is called the book of life. The book of life is the roll book for heaven. Then that other book is a book of deeds, actions, lifestyle. And your name cannot be in both books. Because one records the righteous, the other records the unrighteous. Amen? So the road book for heaven is the righteous book of all these uh, recorded all of the names of the saved. That other book records every lie you ever told, everything you ever done, every sin you ever committed is recorded. Every sin you cause other people to commit, you're paying for that. In fact, God is going to wait till the end of time to, to pronounce judgment on all of us. Because if he judged us once we died, that would be a premature judgment. Because you cannot get all the rewards you deserve. Amen? When you lead people to act in righteousness, and you're the reason why being the vessel that you led someone to faith in Christ, well, you get credit for that. And everybody else, they lead to faith in Christ. On the flip side of that, every sin you do and every sin you cause your kids to do, and they, and they continue your sin, then you got to pay for that too. You got to answer for that too because you set that in motion. Amen? So again, the books were open, which is the book of life. And the, and the dead were judged from the things which are written in the books according to their deeds. Their deeds mean their actions, their lifestyles. And verse 13 says, And the sea gave up the dead within, within it. There are many people who have died and they're buried at sea. And death and Hades gave up the dead within it. Wait a minute. This is what's interesting because even people who have already died, they got to be given up. Because the reason why is because they, didn't have, they don't have final judgment yet. And he said, and they were judged from death and Hades gave up the dead with them. And they were judged, each of them, according to their deeds. It said, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Say, this is the second death, the lake of fire. The first death was a physical death. You had a physical death. Then you had a spiritual death. This is eternal. The second death, you're talking about, that's it. The lake of fire. And here's the kicker, verse 15. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Why wouldn't that be enough to warn people? Why wouldn't that be enough for people to say, no, I, I, I accept Jesus? Why wouldn't that be enough for people to say, I want to live for Jesus? Why wouldn't that be enough for people to say that I don't have to be warned anymore? We heed warnings all the time, don't we? You heed warnings when you drove here. Because you didn't, then you'd had accidents. Amen? You heed warnings when you took your medication. Those of us who take medication. You heed warnings, right? When you, what happens when you don't heed warnings? You have to suffer the consequence of not heeding warnings. A pack of cigarettes can warn you and say, hey, this caused cancer. Bold letters. I don't care. I'm going to smoke it anyway. You got to heed those warnings. But the biggest warning you got to heed is when God is offering you salvation and you, don't, you turn it down. 
God doesn't have to offer you that again. He'd still be just and righteous. You have to decide. As Joshua said, Joshua 24, 15, choose ye this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Is that your declaration today? I've heard enough. I know it's a strong message. But what did you hear about yourself? Are you still playing church? Are you still playing like this is a hit and miss? But you have to know where you stand with God each and every day. Amen? And if you don't know him. On the other day, we had 10 brave kids accept Christ as Savior and Lord during our music camp. They were brave enough to come forward. What about you? And maybe you prayed that prayer before. Maybe it's just been a while. But your relationship with God has grown stale. Everything else has gotten in your life and frustrated you. Because everything is, else is first, but not Jesus. But you don't have to leave here the same way you came. You can leave here empowered by God to live a better life for him. And all it takes is the acceptance of an invitation to say, God, I'm ready to get it right. Regardless of where you've been up until now. Let us pray together. Eternal God, our Father, we bow before you, O God. Thank you for another blessed day. A brand new day that was not promised to us, O God, but we choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, those on the sound of my voice, that they have not accepted your invitation, maybe they have, but they need a, re, a recommitment of their life to you, O God. If that speaks to you, I pray you, I ask you to pray this prayer with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, here I am. I heard you loud and clear. I want to get things right with you, O God. But I allow my job, my family, other things to get in the way. Because I have not been worshiping you like I should. I have not been studying your word like I should. I have not been praying like I should. Lord, I've just been running here and there. With everything in life pulling at me. With my family, with my children. My job, my school. My neighbors, my friends. Lord, today I want to make things right with you. Lord, I can't fix me. But you can but here am I to Lord, I give you all the broken pieces of my life to put together in the, in the picture that you see fit. So I ask, oh Lord, that you forgive me of all my sins, past, present, and future. Today, right now, I accept Jesus as my Savior and Lord. I recommit my life to you, O oh God. And I want to walk with you from this day forward. I trust in you, I love you, and I honor you, and I bless and honor your name. Have your perfect way with us, O oh God. Have your perfect way with me. Touch my life. Bless my life. For my good and for your glory is my prayer. Whatever is about my life that needs to change, I pray you change it, O oh God. I surrender my all to you. I surrender my will for your will, O oh God. And I bless and honor your name. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said amen. Amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand to pray. Father, Father, for you. 
Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. How many of you all like when people you're committed to you to refuse to give you their best? People that you are committed to refuse to love you the way you love them. That's an awful feeling, isn't it? Well, we don't like that when other people do us that way, then we have to stop treating God that way. Amen? Because God always gives us his best. We have access to God's best. All we have to do is be obedient to him. Amen? Regardless of what's going on in the world around us, and everything in chaos, and everything will continue to be in chaos. But if we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, and not our problems, not our circumstances, not our situation, because God already knew those things would come your way, even before you know they would come your way. But if God allowed them to come anyway, then that God is trying to teach us through those situations, and that we can trust him, and that we can lean, and that we can depend on him. God's not going to make anybody get saved. But he will offer his, extend his hand in invitation. And if you know him, begin to live for him. Make yourself available to what's important to him. And then God will allow you to prioritize your life so you have more peace in life, more hope in life. Amen? That you have a life that you're proud to live because your life is saturated with Jesus. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Again, thank you all that supported and participated uh, for our youth camp, music camp. We thank God for our youth and the tremendous job that they did. We want to continue to encourage them and support them. Amen? So thank you all for all you all helped out. Thank you for your prayers. If you've been blessed by today's message, we invite you to go to our website, agapecommunityfellowship.org. There's a place that you can give. You can go and, and check out the pictures and things that are there. And they probably will post more in the days to come of, of what went on with uh, the music event. And so we look forward to the next event. Amen. Already been scheduled for next year. So many of the families were really touched by how I responded to their kids. Uh, they, they, they said, well, that's too long. Do we have to wait? <laughs> and that's when you know that you had a big impact. Uh, you had a big impact. Just using music to teach people to love Jesus. Amen? To encourage them to walk with him. Amen? We we'll also ask that you would, the same, our same website you can give to the ministry here to God. For your contribution, your giving matters tremendously. We have so many plans and things that, that we're looking forward to doing. We're trying to and praying that we have extend a new wing for the youth off the back of the fellowship hall. And so we need the financial resources to do that. So be in prayer for us so that way before we get to that point next year that we have way more space uh, because we need to provide space for our youth and, and children's ministries. Amen. Our plan, our goal is to build classrooms, open space, and even the gymnasium. So we'll be able to invite the kids from the community as well as be able to witness to them and, and grow our church through our youth ministry. Amen. So we thank God for each of you. We thank God that you're here today to hear this message. You can go back and you go online. You can hear the message in its entirety um, as well as listen to messages from the past. So I hope that you do that because we're trying to increase the uh, email traffic to our website uh, so it, it calls our search engine to... to, to uh, it's easy for you to hit it and find it uh, once it's been populated over and over again. So we encourage you to do that. Let us stand for our benediction. God bless each and every one of you. We thank God for what he's doing in your life. And I pray that you would stay strong no matter what's going on. Stick with Jesus. That's your best hope. Amen. Don't let anybody turn you away from your faith. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're struggling through, God always has the answer. Amen. And all we can do is put our concerns into his hands, into his care, and say, God, bless us to be a blessing. Amen. Receive your benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May he always make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. May nothing you face in life be anything you or God cannot handle. May you go forth today 
with God's amazing love and his amazing grace. May he go before you, go with you, and even have your back. Whatever you're lacking, that God would not only meet it, but he would exceed it and bless you forevermore. And may you stay in the boat with God. Amen? Amen. Until we meet again, is our prayer. God bless you, and may he keep you. Amen? Amen. Amen.